While the label Last Comanche may seem somewhat exaggerated, it does serve as, as a symbolic representation rather than like a literal a meaning. It acknowledges the ongoing presence of the Comanche people who thrive within a vibrant community in Oklahoma. The choice of this title aims to capture like the essence and the transformation within the Comanche nation, marking the conclusion of an era defined by their warrior culture. Quanta Parker stands out as the most renowned figure in Comanche history, facing formidable challenges to ensure the safety of his people. Despite not holding the formal title of head chief, he is wildly uh, recognized as the ultimate leader of the Comanche. The pivotal Red River War, as discussed in our, one of our previous videos, uh, it marked a significant turning point for the Comanche people. In the aftermath, Quanta Parker assumed the weighty responsibility of surrendering his nation to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Quanta Parker was actually born into the Nakoni Band, or the Wanderers, uh, under the Comanche umbrella. He was then spent his formative years with the Quahandis, um, where his parents, notable parents, uh, Quahandi Comanche Chief Pete Nakona, and his mother, Cynthia Ann Parker, which was actually a white settler who was abducted at the age of eight, that kind of assimilated into the tribe. Um, more on, before we go further into Quanta's life, we need to kind of touch on Cynthia Ann Parker because she's pretty pivotal and maybe that's why Quanta Parker made the decisions he made in his later life. So Cynthia Ann Parker was born around 1827 and belonged to a prominent Parker frontier family that settled in East Texas in the 1830s. In a dramatic turn of events, she was captured by the Comanches at the age of eight or nine during the raid on Fort Parker, which is in present-day Grosbeck, Texas, in 1836. Bestowed with the Comanche name Nadal, meaning foundling, for you um, Mandalorian fans, the foundlings, uh, she was embraced by the Nakoni Band of Comanches, and she began uh, became the foster daughter of Tabinoka, which is a, a, a chief there. Fully assimilating into Comanche life, Cynthia Ann Parker married Pete Nakona, the Quahandi warrior chief, known as a bunch of different names, but the main name is, is Pete Nakona. Uh, Quanta Parker, their firstborn, entered the world in Wichita Mountains of southwestern Oklahoma around 1850, according to his letter uh, to rancher Charles Goodnight. Alternative sources suggest that his birthplace as Laguna Sabinas or Cedar Lake in Gaines County, Texas. So Cynthia Ann Parker and Pete Nakona also had two more children, uh, Pecos, or they called them Pecan, and uh, Topsana, or Prairie Flower. The family faced tumultuous events in December of 1860, when Cynthia Ann Parker and Topsana were captured in the Battle of Peace River. Conflicting accounts arose regarding Pete uh, Nakona's fate, with some asserting he was wounded and killed, while others, including Quanta Parker, actually dispute this narrative. Subsequently, Cynthia Ann Parker... Um, Quanta Parker's mother and her infant daughter uh, were taken against their will by the Texas Rangers. After 24 years with the Comanche, Cynthia Ann Parker resisted reassimilation, and her daughter Topsana tragically succumbed to illness in 1863. Struggling with her changed circumstances, uh, Cynthia Ann Parker starved herself to death, um, so she committed suicide. Uh, YouTube doesn't like that word, but we're going to use it for historical references. She committed suicide by uh, starving herself to death in March of 1871. So after the death of Pete Nakona, we think around 1864, um, with a man named Parakum, or Bull Bear, assuming leadership as the head chief of the Kwandi people, and Horseback leading the Coney people, uh, Quanta Parker and his brother Pecos found guidance under Horseback's mentorship. Building on the teachings of Pete Nakona and Iron Jacket, Horseback imparted the traditions of the Comanche warrior upon them, and Quanta Parker rose to prominence as a formidable warrior. Departing briefly, he later rejoined the Quahandi Band alongside warriors from another group. In October of 1867, a young Quanta Parker participated as an observer in treaty negotiations at Medicine Lodge, Kansas, accompanying the Comanche chiefs. Horseback notably spoke about Quanta Parker's refusal to sign the treaty during these negotiations. As the 1870s dawned, the Plains Indians faced mounting challenges in their struggles against the U.S. government for their land. The capture of uh, Kiowa Chief Sitting Bear, Big Tree, and Santana marked a turning point uh, in the Kiowa, Comanche, and Southern Cheyenne tribes joined forces in response. 
Colonel Ronald McKenzie, who we've talked about in the previous video, played a key role in rounding up and confronting Indians who had not settled on reservations. They are trying to find them and put them someplace where they didn't have to deal with them uh, on the open plains. Uh, in 1873, Asatai, I still don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, from one of our previous videos, but Asatai, who was a self-proclaimed Comanche medicine man, called for a gathering of all Comanche bands for a sun dance, a Kiowa ritual not typical among the Comanche. At the gathering near the Red River, Asatai and Quanah Parker recruited warriors for retaliatory raids into Texas from Oklahoma. However, some Comanche chiefs, uh, including Isa Rosa, which was named White Wolf, um, and a man named Sound of the Sunrise, awesome name, uh, recognized the real threat posed by buffalo hide merchants to their way of life. Suggesting an alternative target, these chiefs proposed focusing on the merchants rather than engaging in raids. A war party influenced by Aes Sedai's claim of protective medicine headed towards the trading post of Adobe Walls. Um, I keep referencing it, but we've talked about the Comanche before. I have a whole video on the Adobe Walls. Um, we're going to touch on it briefly, but there's a intricate video about the, the importance of the Adobe Walls battle in super North Texas. So the attempted raid on Adobe Walls marked by the resilience of the saloon keeper and merchants armed with 50 caliber sharps rifles, way outpowered uh, with the Comanche head, resulted in a decisive turning point. Quanah Parker leading the charge faced adversary as his horse was shot from underneath him and he himself sustained a non-fatal injury. The attack triggered a shift in Washington's policy leading to the Red River War, culminating in the Battle of Palo Duro Canyon on September 28th of 1874. Uh, Mackenzie, your old friend Mackenzie, we, we touched on briefly in his Tonkawa scouts, who are actually found a lot more in central Texas where I am, and kind of allied with the uh, Americans to scout specifically against the Comanche. Um, we're going to do a video just on the Tonkawa. Um, so the Tonkawa scouts dismantled the, uh, along with the U.S. forces, dismantled the Comanche village at Palo Duro, uh, dealing a significant blow and destroying nearly all of the Comanche horses, uh, which was their source of wealth and power. It's about 1,500 horses died during this. That's a, that's a lot. Um, the Comanche ultimately... Um, kind of surrendering in 1875. So collaborating with Colonel McKenzie and Indian agent James M. Hayworth, uh, Quanah Parker played a pivotal role in the resettlement of the Comanche uh, onto the Kiowa Comanche Apache Reservation in southwestern Indian Territory, which is now Oklahoma. So let's move on a little bit towards um, Quanah Parker's life after his warrior. So this is, we know he's famous before that, but we he gets really important going further. He does a lot for the Comanche. Some of it is, people think it are, is a good thing. Some of them think he's just a complete sellout, but we're here to just report on that. So, um, so they put Quanah Parker into the um, reservation. They built him a massive house. It's still standing. It's called the Star House in Cache, Oklahoma. And that was his residence. It I'll show pictures of it, but it is like a traditional house with heats, heat and stars literally on the roof um, and big beams, front porches. Um, so this started. he started drawing a lot of attention from um, other tribe members and also very important people in America, specifically uh, one of the most famous presidents of the time and maybe ever in the United States, President Theodore Roosevelt. Um, Quanah Parker would engage in hunting excursions with uh, Roosevelt, um, forging a unique connection between them. Uh, despite such associations, he diverged from mainstream norms. Uh, he did not believe in monogamy uh, or the traditional Protestant, ter uh, Protestant church. Uh, but instead, Quanah Parker embraced uh, the tenets of the Native American church movement, standing as one of its founding members. So the choice reflected his commitment to preserving and advancing the spiritual heritage of his people. So accepting that their way of life has come to an end, but we're not going to give up on everything. We're going we're gonna to push forward and, and change a couple things, but keep on to our own traditions. So with Quanah Parker being credited as one of the early leaders of the Native American church movement, his main um, addition to that was the introduction of the peyote religion, um, with the psychedelic drug um, that you see in the peace pipes, um, into the Native American church movement. So this followed after he had a near-fatal account with a bull in Texas, pretty Texas of him to almost be killed by a bull, uh, where he sustained pretty severe wounds. Seeking healing, a Mexican curandra uh, prepared a, a 
potent peyote tea, say that three times, uh, prepared a potent peyote tea, uh, sparking Quantum Parker's involvement with the peyote religion. He, ta- he was taught that peyote was a sacred medicine uh, used with water during Native American church ceremonies. So Quantum Parker endorsed the half moon style of the peyote ceremony, distinct from the later cross ceremony influenced by Cato practices introduced by John Wilson. Um, Quantum Parker has a really cool quote about this um so one of the main things he talked about the difference between the white man's church and indian church um is he would say quote the white man goes into church into his church house and talks about jesus but the indian goes into his teepee and talks to jesus i think that's pretty incredible quote um so the modern reservation era in native american history owes much of the adoption of the the church and christianity uh, is spearheaded by quanta parker and a man named john wilson which we talked about the, for a second there although not part of a traditional native american um like religious practices this movement gained prominence in the late 19th century blending cultures from both native americans of mexico and other southern tribes with ancient use of peyote in spiritual practices so Quanta Parker advocated for the mindful use. So let's let's circle back on that. The mindful use, not just smoking peyote all day, but using it, um, the mind-altering substances for ritual purposes. So while Quanta Parker, as we said before, um, he earned praise for cultural guardianship amongst many tribes, he is not immune to criticism, particularly from some Comanche quarters. Detractors argued that he had sold out to the white man, which. I can see that we fight to the end and I mean, they did get kind of whipped in uh, Adobe walls, but they, they did surrender. Um, and he adapted his life to like a traditional rancher's lifestyle. Uh, critics pointed to his dressing and his living style, uh, which some perceived as more like European American than traditional Comanche. Uh, a man named Paul Shat Smith framed the debate as the basic uh, Comanche political question is questioning whether Quanta Parker is a sellout or a patriot. Um, but he did embrace U- European-American customs, but he did also maintain his identity by consistently wearing his hair long and in braids. It's like every single picture we have shown is him in his braids, which are so awesome looking. Uh, and he still resisted the conformity of U.S. mayor's laws. He had up to eight wives at the same time, so uh, he was not going to you know, get rid of that part of his culture. Um, so let's move on to how we know some of this stuff and his life uh, aside from the church. Um, so we can see a correspondence between uh, Quanta Parker and a man named Samuel Birch Burnett uh, Sr. Uh, and his son Thomas Lloyd Burnett reveal uh, mutual admiration and respect. See, while um, historical records provide limited information about Quanta Parker until his involvement in the attack on Buffalo Hunters at Adobe Walls, um, there's only like fragmented details with his interaction with Apache and that could lead to um, how he discovered the peyote religion kind of uh, dipping his toes into that and taking the adoption of the Native American church um, so uh, Kwana Parker's involvement uh, kind of evolved on tribal lands opening for Anglo ranching interests uh, it led to close relations with Texas cattlemen including the Burnett family which we just talked about so he said, if we're going to put on this, uh, on this reservation, we're going to make some money on it because um, that we're, it's not going to be really given to us. We can see that now. It's, it's, it's penance. Um, so by 1884, Quanta Parker's uh, efforts facilitated the tribe's first grass payments for grazing rights, strengthening the bonds between him and his friend, uh, friends, the Burnett's. Uh, Burnett, with a general, uh, like a genuine respect for Native American rights, learned and embraced Comanche ways, passing his appreciation uh, and friendship to his family. Uh, the Comanches bestowed upon him the name, and I'm going to try to pronounce it, Masasuta, meaning Big Boss, pretty, pretty cool name, uh, reflecting the regard for Bur- Burnett. Quanta Parker's adaptation uh, to the white man's life led to prosperity as a rancher. And you can, like I said, you can still see Star House um, to this day. It is kind of was part of an, of, of an amusement park, kind of moved to somebody's uh, actual property. Um, there's been a lot of movement for people to take that, you know, have that move to like a, a place where it can be preserved. Right now they can't get through to the owner for them to let go of Starhouse. It is owned by on somebody's property. You can drive by it. It's in pretty bad disrepair. Um, but if you read the most recent book about Quantum Parker's life, 
uh, and it just escapes me at this second. Um, but they kind of go into some detail about it. So uh, over the next 27 years, Quanah Parker and the Burnett shared numerous experiences, including their involvement in public events and discussions with uh, Theodore Roosevelt, like we talked about earlier. Uh, Burnett's assistance in significant manners, such as Quanah Parker's request to retain tribal ownership of lands in the relocation of his mother and sister's remains, further solidified their enduring friendship. So in 1872, Quanah Parker, according to his son Baldwin Parker, um, who actually filmed in some, like, was an actor in certain, like, some silent films, which is kind of wild that we're not that far removed from Quanah Parker and the Wild West. Um, Baldwin Parker said that Quanah entered matrimony with two wives. His first, uh, Tahoe, yeah, hailed from the Mescalero Apache tribe, the daughter of their chief, Old Wolf, acquiring her for five mules. Um, doesn't seem like that much. Um, their union only lasted a year as Tahoe Ya yeah, struggled with the Comanche language. Upon her request to return home, Quanah Parker sent her back to her people. Um, his second wife in 1872, uh, Wekya, or Wekya, was the daughter of Yellow Bear, uh, a Penatika Comanche subchief. Despite initial complications, including her engagement to another warrior, some Comanche drama for you, um, she and Quanah Parker eloped, later reconciling with Yellow Bear. Uh, the amalgamation of their two bands formed the largest force of Comanche Indians. Quanah Parker eventually took six wives, or six more wives, I'm sorry, um, and their names, I'm going to try to pronounce, uh, Choni, or Shoni, Macheta Wuki, Aa Wutham Takum, Kobe, Tope, and Tanarsi. Um, a, a photograph from the 1890s captured by William B. Ellis showcased Quanah Parker and two of his wives, identified as Tope and Shoni. In addition, uh, Quanah Parker had... Uh, a total of eight wives and 25 children, and he adopted some of them. On the day that Quanah Parker took his last breath, his wives and children quietly mourned his departure, making, marking the occasion with two distinct ceremonies. An article published on March 29th of 1911 in the Leavenworth Times of Leavenworth, Kansas, detailed the first ceremony, which was a tribal ritual. As the sun rose in the day following Quanah's uh, passing, Marcus Poco, a chief medicine man and preacher for the tribe, led the observation, or observance, I'm sorry. Marcus Polo believed that to have Mexican and Comanche roots. Don he donned a buckskin suit adorned with a buckskin bag containing the chief's cherished feathers, trinkets, and jewelry, including a diamond brooch presented by his cattlemen friends. Commencing their uh, observance, Marcus Poco praised the chief and invoked the great spirit to welcome him. Subsequently, the funeral procession proceeded to the location for the second ceremony held at the Post Oak Mission Cemetery. The second ceremony unfolded at 3 p.m. Uh, and was overseen by Reverend A.J. Becker, a local Mennonite missionary. Reverend Becker and his wife, uh, Magdalena, had dedicated themselves to missionary work among the Comanche since the establishment of the Post Oak Mission around a decade prior. Following the sermon, attendees joined in singing the Swan, the Swan Dirge, and then the chief was laid to rest near the resting place of his mother, Cynthia, where, remember, they got their, her remains moved. But Reverend and Mrs. Becker continued their service at the mission until the minister's retirement in 1941, forming close bands with the Comanche people and affectionately, who affectionately gave them nicknames. In his book, The Last Comanche Chief, author Bill Neely reflects on Quana and Cynthia, stating... Quote, separated in life, they were united until uh, united in death. In 1957, a significant expansion of Fort Sill led to the reburial of Cynthia and Quana at the Fort Sill Post Cemetery in Lawton, which you can actually go see today. 